This is Ron Guttardi, volunteer director of the oral history program of the Battleship New Jersey. And today is October the 6th, 2016. And we're here on the Battleship New Jersey to interview Robert Dunn. And where are you from, uh, Robert? Granville, Michigan. Granville, Michigan. Okay. And I'm going to call you Bob if that's okay. That's fine. Okay. And why don't you start by just telling us how you got into the Navy? A uh, senior in high school and uh, at the height of the Vietnam War, pretty much. And uh, my mother worked in the high school principal's office and she knew the recruiters. And she kept actively trying to get me to go in the Navy. And it was hard to get in the Navy at that time. Uh, so uh, eventually I made it in and I signed a 120 day delay program. Uh, so I didn't go in until September. Late so you September. finished high school? I, yeah, I finished high school and I had the summer off. and So that's how it all started. And where did you go for your training? Uh, Great Lakes. And uh, it went well. I had did well. I was six squad leader there. and uh, My parents and my girlfriend or wife at that time came down to see me at graduation and uh, my uncle came and he was in the Navy in World War II so he wanted to see what things were different then, you know, from what it was back then. What uh, did he tell you was different? Well, the barracks for one thing were just the old wooden barracks and the outside wash basins and we had all the modern stuff inside. But new, new barracks or battalion headquarters and whatnot. What do you remember most about your basic training at Great Lakes? Oh, Good or bad? I can't say as I had a bad experience. Uh, everything went pretty good for me. I didn't get into trouble. Uh, I was a squad leader. and How I ever got picked for that, I don't know. I was in charge of the... Uh, sixth squad was in charge of the clothesline uh, detail, or clothes that... Uh, you hung your clothes outside on a line, you tied little knots on the, your clothes to hang them up and the spacing and all that meant something for inspection. So that was my duty to make sure that we did all that correctly. Um, the only thing is the, uh, our commanding officer, who was a first class petty officer, would sneak some of our clothes out and wash them on the outside and bring them back so they'd be really nice and white. And so we would score better. <laughs> They all cheated back then. I think. Uh, and the food was pretty good. We marched everywhere, and all the classes we went to, I, I was always so hot, and I'd fall asleep in the classrooms. They'd have to wake me up. That's about all I can remember about boot camp. Uh, this was in the fall of. Yeah, it would be September. late September. Actually, the first part of August. What year was it? 1966. And I came home uh, first part of December, or middle part of December, in time for Christmas, and before I was shipped out. And what was your first uh, I assignment? I was sent to Washington, D.C. Uh, I was to be a driver for some admiral. And I was scared to death because I was out of boot camp and I was going to go work for an admiral as a driver. And why me? I, I met a captain and uh, he interviewed me and said, I really don't need any more drivers. So he decided, well, we're going to put you in transit barracks and uh, we'll find another position for you. So I was in uh, transit there for two or three months in Washington, D.C. And I got orders to go to P Patuxent River Naval Air Station in Maryland. It's a uh, where they train new new pilots and, and fighter jets and stuff like that. And I worked in the ground electronics division. Um, just Did you have any electronics training? No. It was uh, supposed to be for... Um, they were going to train us to work in emer emergency rescue operations in the uh, Chesapeake Bay area with if a plane went down, they wanted to go out and, you know, rescue. 
and they I was an Angevin grade uh, in my branch, or how do I say? There's deck hands and then Angevin grades. You're rating. Rating, yeah. You're you're chosen part of the Navy you want to be in, like a. Uh, so anyway, but we never did that, and I just spent a whole year of shore duty there, which was fine, and I worked in the storeroom handing out tubes and transistors and stuff for their pair guys, uh, ETs they called them, uh, electronic technicians, and um, until I got my year of shore duty done, and then I got orders to come to the battleship New Jersey. And where was the battleship? At that time, it was in Philadelphia, just across the bay here. And uh, they sent us to San Diego for pre-commissioning training. And uh, a it was of, still being prepared for right. It was in the shipyards then, mm -hmm. and they'd taken it out of mothballs. And um, so we went out to San Diego and uh, did our pre-commissioning training. Most of us had never been on a ship before in our life, you know, that I remember. Probably two-thirds of the crew. And uh, one day they flew us all to Philadelphia. And they took the whole crew out to San Diego? Oh, yeah. San that's Diego. where the, the school was, to do the training, to just a reminder of what you should have learned in boot camp, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Come to Philadelphia, and uh, we spent probably a couple months here, or a month and a half. I don't recall exactly. While the ship was finalizing, finalizing, it. yeah, we well worked on the ship, cleaning and painting and all that that we were supposed to do. And I uh, then they had the commissioning ceremony, and that's when my parents and my uh, girlfriend or wife to be came down for the commissioning. So. Uh, after that, did sea trials, everything was fine, and then uh, we shipped off, went through the Panama Canal to uh, Long Beach, California, which was the home port. How, and how tight was the fit going through the canal? Very tight. They had water hoses squirting on the side in case a spark would come up. They bumped the side and they were afraid to, to, if there was oil in the water that, that uh, could start a fire. So uh, that was beautiful scenery. Uh, came down through Cape Hatteras. By the way, Cape Hatteras was very rough, windy seas, and uh, that's my first experience of rough seas before we got to Panama. But, uh, I was unlucky. I had the duty, so I couldn't go ashore in uh, Panama City. I would like to see my first foreign country, but anyway. Uh, come around to Long Beach and waited for orders. I think we left in the uh, first part of September for our first tour in Vietnam. Um, September of 67, this was? Yes. Yeah. And um, we did a, a couple cruises uh, around California. I think the Admiral came aboard for a while. I don't remember who the Admiral was at that time. It was pretty exciting. You only battleship, you know, commissioned at that time. So, uh, but when we left, we went to Hawaii and stayed there for a few days, R and R, and and uh, went uh, from there on to Subic Bay. Who was the skipper at the time? Captain Snyder. Mm -hmm. um, he was the uh, crew enlisted man's captain. Uh, all the stories you hear about him were true. He allowed us to grow beards and didn't have to wear a hat when we were up topside. And you could wear your dungaree shirt anywhere. And he would come down and uh, eat with you on the mess decks. And just the uh, neatest guy in the world. Very approachable and whatnot. So. And what was your job on the ship? I worked in the machine shop. <clears throat> um, we made repaired parts on the ship that uh, steam valves, uh, especially, and uh, made screws uh, for valve stems and, and pump shafts that would get worn. We'd have to repair them or make new ones. And 
all the different machines in there. Did you have any training in that kind of stuff? Uh, I only when I was in high school, and um, I did that when I what they call it a jobs corps thing. I did a half went to school in the morning, in the afternoon I worked in the job shop, and it was kind of a training period for me then. I just the Navy couldn't. didn't give you any no, training I, for that. No, when I tried to get into school, they wanted me to enlist longer, and that was not going to happen. I didn't want to do that. I would like to went to A school, but whatever. So, but you, I knew a lot of things already. I had machine shop in high school, and then worked in that job shop, and I had practical experience, you know, enough to to do things. So. Okay, so you were on your way to the Philippines. Yeah, in Subic Bay we took on fuel and I don't remember if it had more ammunition and uh, um, then we went online and actually we went up to North Vietnam. I think that was the biggest reason they brought us back or put the ship in commission was to, we could launch uh, support or knock down the, um, where the Vietnamese were. How do I want to say? I guess they were trying to shoot down our warships or uh, planes from North Vietnam. We would go up there and we wouldn't have to fly any planes in there. We could shoot the shells a long ways and blow up these batteries that were messing with everybody. Which coast of Vietnam were you on? On the well, the east, east side of the East course, coast. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we were up there only about a month, month and a half, we, and then they had the bombing halt. And they stopped bombing in North Vietnam altogether. So then we, when we went back online again, we started giving ground support to the troops in South Vietnam. And I had many people that come up to me that were in the Army or Marines that we give ground support to uh, when they needed uh, artillery. They'd call in for the Jersey and we'd give ground support. Yeah, we've interviewed a few of those people, yeah, and including they, one named Dolly North, if you remember. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my neighbor was in the Marines, uh, and he told me many times they called in Jersey for ground support, and, and he says that Vietnamese would just scatter. If they weren't, they were gone. It just, the firepower was tremendous. So, it made you feel good, but... Um, we did that, and uh, a couple times on the line, we usually went out uh, five to six weeks at a time, and then come back in for a little R&R &R and refuel, and um, midway through our trip, uh, we were supposed to be gone about nine months, we took a R and R trip down to Singapore, Malaysia, and on the way down we crossed the equator, and of course I went through the initiation of being a shellback for from a polywalk, so I, that was kind of neat to have that happen. Tell us some of the weird <clears throat> things they did during that those ceremonies. Well, you had a <laughs> first of all in the morning you had a well the night before we had a big boxing match matches on the fantail and they had a beauty pageant a, a guy from each division. with beautiful looking guys. Oh, yeah. yeah, they dressed them all up and they wore their lipstick and hair and whatnot and. We had a beauty pageant, and we all voted who was the best looking. It was just a fun thing, you know. Were you a contestant? No, no. <laughs> uh, but then the next morning, things were different. We had a special breakfast. Uh, you couldn't eat anything, I don't think. It, they made things taste awful, and you just, you just didn't eat anything. You tried it. It looked good, but it wasn't any good for all the polywogs, you know. And then they had us all line up on deck because there were so many. I think we had around 1,500 uh, people on board about that time and only about 100 or so were shellbacks. So they, they had a lot of them that they had to initiate. So every division would be uh, in a group until they called your division up and you'd have to go through the initiation. And they had the fire hoses and they would whip you on the butt because you had to crawl on your hands and knees. And we went through tubes of, uh, they were full of garbage. You had to crawl through them. And then they dumped you into a big tank full of stuff. And 
And then King Neptune was two of them. They're big guys. And they had bare bellies with something all over their bellies. And you crawled up there and you had to kiss their belly. Of course, they rubbed your face and all. <laughs> it was quite a deal. And the Navy's big on ceremonies. Oh, yeah. So then uh, I remember one first class, and he happened to be in my division, did not want to do it. He was, he was scared to death that they were really going to pick on him because he's the first class, never been a shellback. So uh, Charlie Gross was his name, and uh, he never went through the initiation. I don't know what ever happened to him, but most of us did, as far as I know. And the captain, he was all part of it too. It's just a fun day. So, but then uh, Singapore, and then back online again a few, couple more times at Vietnam. Um, Did you have an assigned battle station during? Uh, you know, in when we were in North Vietnam, I did. I was behind Number Three Gun Turret. That's where my battle station was. But when you were doing what? Pardon me? What were you supposed to be doing there? Just for damage control. Uh, everybody had a different area that that was your area to uh, take care of if something happened. Um, but you didn't go to general quarters when you we, were... Yeah, we did. That was No, I mean when you were in off of South Vietnam. No, we did not. We could we could be up topside and I could see Vietnam. It, I could Even see, when they were firing the oh, big yeah. guns? Yes. Yeah. You could see the projectiles leave sometimes. And, uh, what was it like to uh, be on the main deck when the 16-inch guns were being fired? It would, it'd be loud, but I remember the vibration more that would just shake the ship, you know, especially if they fired more than one projectile at a time, you know, maybe three, all, all three at once, or three at one turret, I mean. And they had a time zone that in the morning they would fire from number one gun turret and towards noon it was number two and then three was in the afternoon. And if they needed more time, they would announce over the speaker, we're now going to be firing from whatever gun turret. And you either stayed at forward or aft if you were topside. Uh, sometimes the five inch, I remember one night, the five inch gun mounts were, they ran, it seemed like all night long. They were just boom, 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 boom. I remember that, and you wake up in the morning, there's shell casings all over the deck. Um, a lot of people told me that the five inch guns made a louder noise than the 16 inch guns did. Is that true? Maybe a, gosh, I guess I don't really remember too much. Uh, it probably had a different noise, a sharper noise. Sharper, yeah. I guess the word you'd use. Um, um, we, like I said, we went to Subic Bay for a couple times, and then uh, the last time or two, we went to uh, Yokosuka, Japan. That was our port for refueling and taking on ammo and stuff. So, got to see a little bit of Japan at that time. Um, and we'd go back online in South Vietnam. Take um, any fire from shore? No. Nobody ever, ever got close. So when the armament on this ship, I just felt safe the whole time. And it was just like going to a job. That, you know, you worked and you did your thing. And, but uh, it got to be lonely at times. So. But then uh, when we started back, uh, I think we were four days out from coming back from our first tour. That's when the Pueblo, the, uh, mm -hmm. well, it was a submarine, wasn't it? I can't remember. No, I think it was a surface ship, but okay. I don't remember. Maybe a destroyer or something destroyer. like that? Destroyer. Some sort of a... Um, Pueblo incident, yeah. Yeah, it was um, a reconnaissance type of view, I think. Anyway, they turned us around and sent us back to Japan thinking that maybe we were going to go to war with Korea or something. I don't know. Uh, but we only spent two or three days in Japan again and then they released us to come back. Um, so we came back to the United States and I anticipated going on another tour uh, in the fall again with, on the New, New Jersey. When did you come back to the U.S.? What, we were, what month? 
Probably the first part of June. 68. Yep. Yep. And uh, I went on leave, of course, and came back. I don't remember how long after that, but they decided that they weren't going to do it again. They uh, were going to decommission the ship. So it was a surprise to everybody. And um, so then we went up to uh, Bremerton, Washington and started decommissioning the ship. And we did that. So you were there through the whole decommissioning? Yes. To the, the end, and I got orders. How to did enough. the crew feel about it? Oh yeah, they were all young like me. They had time to do. I guess it didn't matter if you were on this ship or another ship. But uh, I think most of us enjoyed this ship. I mean, it was. You felt proud to be aboard this ship. When I went on to my second shift, I had still had New Jersey on my sleeve. I was proud. I wanted people to know that I served on the USS New Jersey. But they, they quite quickly let me know that you got to remove them and put your new ship on. I went on a, a tender, 80, uh, Samuel Gompers, 8037 after that for my last uh, year. And that was spent in Subic Bay and Actually, uh, Yokosuka again. So. Ten, tending what kind of ships? Possibly? They were destroyers or submarines that were coming alongside. And when we were in, we stayed in port all the time. And they were bringing stuff. Or their ships would tie up next to us on the docks, and they would bring their stuff on. And they had a huge machine shop and all kinds of other repair things, and facilities. And, uh, and this was in Subic Bay. Yes. So you spent a year there, didn't so did you um, get probably to about five, four months, five months, five months there in Subic Bay, and then we went to Japan again, and we did it out of there. Ships would come up there, and come alongside. So did, did you get to see some of the Philippines or Japan? Yes, I went when I was in the Philippines. I went to uh, Manila, took a tour to Manila, and through the jungle, took a tour and. Canoeing uh, through the jungle, and it was exciting to see how people lived, uh, you know, back in the way back in the jungle. Uh, my dad, when he went World War II, landed uh, in Manila, so he'd have been there. And my uh, future father-in-law had been in a lot of the battles. Uh, They're both in the army, but he was over there about four years, I think, wasn't he? different battles. Uh, he's seen a lot of action. My dad kind of got in the, toward the tail end of the World War II. <clears throat> what about Japan? What, what just, uh, can you tell us? I went to Tokyo. Um, went a few days spent there and rode on the bullet train and uh, seen the different sites around the great Buddha of Kamakura, I think it was called. Um, probably did other things I don't remember. <laughs> How did the Japanese treat the U.S. sailors? Do you, do you Very well. Yeah. Very well. They uh, never had a problems. Um, I thought they were quite friendly. Um, never had any problems really. No. Um, it's just nice to learn different cultures and. Mm -hmm. you know, try to experience some of the food they would eat or eat. Did you have any, did you have any favorite foods, Japanese or Philippines? Just foods? the, um, not so much Philippines, probably Japanese, uh, just rice dishes and things that they made that I like. Oh, and uh, going to Hong Kong went there once too. I forgot about that. I had some suits tailor made there and very cheap, you know. And, that was an interesting port too. In what so, way? It just, gosh, I don't know. It just the people were so nice, and just I don't know. I just had a good time there. Um, it just the, the experience of being in the Navy is you got to see the world, and that was that's what they advertise, and it's true. You 
seen a lot of things you most people will never see at the expense of the Navy. But my only regret is sometimes I wish I'd have kept in touch with some of my uh, sail shipmates uh, on both ships, but I wasn't smart enough to keep their names and addresses. I got their names, but I suppose I could find them on the internet search. Yeah, there is a, there's some organizations of uh, uh, you know that are of mm -hmm. former former veterans uh, from the ship. Are you active in the, the veterans of the New Jersey at all? No, no, okay. no. I, but there is something up. The quarter, quartermaster up topside has some information about that. I think I don't I was told that on the quarter deck here. Yeah. Okay. So I'll see him when I leave. Uh, see what he's got. Did they ask you to sign the log upstairs? Yes, they did. Good. Now. Yep. So this has been a very interesting uh, tour on the ship. It's, I got to see a lot more than I thought we could. Uh, what did the, uh, how did the engineering space or the uh, machine shop? Exactly it, like I remember. Exactly. exactly. They didn't change much. No. They, you, they actually put in a little Bridgeport machine with a, a little digital readout one, one that I used when I, I worked in Tool and Dia in, uh, after the Navy. But you know, and that was added, and all the other machines are the same. You know, they just didn't change. They're just regular lathes and milling machines and whatnot. So, yeah, I had a good time. What else did you visit on the ship today? Where else did you go? Uh, to go down to see the uh, the brig or the seen the laundry brig laundry or? room. My division actually covered the uh, evaporators, half uh, steering, the um, the engine room where um, that would drive the half steering. You know, on a what division were you in? A division. And the machine shop, of course, we took care of the laundry, uh, the mechanical part, any repairs on that. Um, I said the evaporators, didn't I? I think, yeah. And the machine shop. Evaporators were for making uh, fresh water? Fresh water, out salt mm -hmm. water, yes. Yep. And uh, I stood watching probably all the different departments, you know, over time. Uh, the mid-watch, working from midnight to four o'clock in the morning, was always the killer. And, uh, How did they rotate? Did they rotate the, uh, yeah, the watches? Did. Oh, yeah. So you didn't get stuck on no, the mid-watch for a long no, period of time? No, that was, you rotate, I don't remember how often, but probably once a week. And you got to sleep in a half hour longer, I think. You just get to bed and then time to get up again. Well, they let you sleep a little longer. When you did what? The mid watch? Mid, yes, mid watch. What was your favorite watch? Uh, probably the first one right after work. When we knocked off ship's work, that was probably the easiest one. Four to eight. Because during that time, you'd go to have dinner and whatever. But yeah, we go down and. They'd play cards in, uh, in the compartment, uh, or you'd go on the mess decks and there'd be movies. And um, Where did you play cards? In what compartment? Like in, in our birthing compartment. Okay. Uh, what did you be, play? Poker? No, they played uh, Pinochle mostly. Did they? Yeah. I never knew how to play it until the last few years I learned how to play. I never played I played other card games. Um, just to pass the time away. But a lot of times I would just go up on board uh, the ship on topside, especially out of sea, and I just enjoyed just watching the world go by. Did you ever sleep on the main deck? On the uh, outside, I mean? I think one time a bunch of us did, just for the fun of it. I think probably, I th think when we were going over, going over to Vietnam the first time. I don't know, we were a bunch of us sitting up there and Oh, we were in charge of the uh, motorboats, uh, the captain's gigs too, 
um, maintaining those and uh, as far as the engine part. Uh, so that was part of our job. Did you have an admiral on board at any time? We did uh, when we were in um, Long Beach. When we had a, we had mid midshipman crews, they called it. He came on board and made it his flagship for that summer before we went to Vietnam. I think it was that, or the time when we came back. I don't remember. Is that when you did the cruise up and down? Yeah, the, the we West went up Coast? to San Francisco actually, and come back down and went to Hawaii again. Um, that wasn't tough duty, was it? No, no. <laughs> well, I've been to Hawaii three times in my career, and I was still in the Navy. So that was, yeah, that was kind of nice. So what year did you get out? 68? 1970. 70. I went in 66. So that was my college years. <laughs> so, how, how did the Navy affect your life? What, uh, what did it do to you? <laughs> well, I think my upbringing was pretty much taught me to be responsible and be polite and, and promptness. That was all instilled in me. And the Navy just made, reassured that part. I still. I did my job, and did what I was told. Um, I don't know, I just respected officers. And, um, I guess that's probably the main thing. Did you get friendly with any officers? Uh, probably off duty. I remember one chief petty officer I had, he was kind of a, and I can't think of his name right now, I uh, really respected him. He wanted to teach all of us. If we didn't have formal training, he was going to come down every night for a couple hours and help us learn how to run different machines and do different things like you were going to an A school. Um, he wanted everybody to, if you want to learn, I'm going to teach you. I don't think a lot of other chiefs would have done that. He was just a different kind of a guy. So I respected him greatly. Uh, we learned a lot from him. But then uh, that's just before they decided to decommission the ship, so I never got to be around him as long as I would have liked. But, uh, yeah, so I had a good experience in the Navy. So you came out in 1970 and uh did you use your, your Navy, some of your Navy, Navy training and subsequent employment? I uh, ended up working for General Motors, um, um, and I eventually uh, got into Tool and Dot. Um, I applied for it, took a test, and gained a got a uh, apprentice program there, and got into that. So continued, to, yeah. It, the Navy taught me some things, and that helped me to get into the apprenticeship program. I guess I'm more mechanically inclined, so yeah, I, I worked good. Any other stories you want to tell us before we close? Hmm? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> Probably the one of the. Highlights was having the Bob Hope show on board ship in 1968, and um, it was I was sitting just below number one gun turret on the. Where was the ship at the time? We off the coast of Vietnam. Um, and Margaret Rosie Greer was here in the. Um, oh, who that? The Gold Diggers. It was a all-girl dance team thing, you know. Of course, I, all the guys liked all them. Them. Oh, yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually had got Ann Margaret's and Bob Hope's signature, but I lost it somewhere. Never did find it, but they were on the mess decks having dinner and, with us, you know. And at the very end, 
of the show. We were, were asked to sing Silent Night, and we did. And we started singing and found out later that the camera panned onto me only as we were singing Silent Night. So all of my family at home saw me on the Bob Hope Show. Oh, that's that nice. Me. I would like to get a copy of that program somehow, but I, we haven't been able to find it, research it. So. We may have some parts of it here. I've seen parts of it, but it never, that whole, I'd like, I know we filmed it back then, because it was played over on our ship's TVs. So I would like to have had a copy of that, but, you know, of the whole show, it'd been kind of fun. And especially at the end, of course. But it was a fun show, it was an exciting day for everybody, and uh, every division was allowed to you know, a lottery if you wanted to go exchange places with an army or a marine in Vietnam for the day. It was on Christmas Day, and uh, I would love to go gone in the in country, but I didn't get chosen. But yeah, I got to see the show. But we had some army and marine, probably sixty guys, come over for the day and just uh, for, the show. for the yeah, show. Yeah, for the show, and they spent the whole day and just just to get Vietnam off their mind. You know, they certainly had a lot harder than I ever had. Uh, so I'm grateful for, for that. Uh, well, that. That was a nice thing to do. Yeah. No, we, uh, I felt very fortunate. The old ship looks a little older than I thought. You know. Today, you mean? It need, yeah, it needs a lot of work. <laughs> yes, it You does. didn't see all the rust and all the teak wood like that, no way. Yeah, we're trying to replace it gradually. I'm sure they told you that. Oh yeah, it's a money issue. It's a lot of money to yeah, maintain, even just to uh, keep it this way. And we got to take it out of the water sometime in the next couple of years too. That's going to really? be expensive. Yeah. To what? Paint? Try dock and treat the bottom. You know, get the barnacles off and. Uh, yeah, I've seen it in dry dock it a couple it. times. So. It's pretty massive. There's just as much under the water as there is on top. And the screws are so massive, it's just... I've got pictures of my uh, yearbooks, I guess you call them yearbooks, uh, of guys in the dry docks standing next to the screws on there, and they're just little guys compared to the size of those screws.